Paying student fees is quick and easy with CIBC International Student Pay. With our secure web portal, you can pay tuition, residence fees, and more online 24-7. Pay in your preferred currency. Lock in a competitive foreign exchange rate from CIBC, a leading global financial institution. Track your payment online and receive ongoing status updates until your payment is complete. CIBC International Student Pay, the easier way to pay for your studies abroad. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next session, Leveling Up World-Class Universities, World-Leading Access. I, of course, would like to start by stopping to acknowledge that we're on the lands of, of First Nations people, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and I stop to acknowledge that, as I'm sure you all do, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to all Indigenous people here today. Ladies and gentlemen, this session will consider our current and, importantly, our future approach to driving access, genuine access, to tertiary education in Australia. This country can be proud in that it delivers world-class education already, but as many people who live in regional or rural and remote areas, uh, our First Nations people, uh, people who identify as living with a disability, and many other groups will tell you, there's a history of significant underrepresentation of so many groups in our tertiary education sector. As the Federal Minister for Education, Jason Clare, said just recently, where you live, how much your parents earn, whether you are Indigenous or not, is still a major factor in whether you're a student or a graduate of an Australian university. And I think all of us here would agree that that sh simply should not be the case. Because we all know that education changes lives. For the individual, of course, it increases your earning potential and your choice in your career. It increases the chances of your relatives and friends accessing a tertiary education as well. For society, it provides, uh, through research, new knowledge and uh, innovation. But for the individual in society, it provides qualified workforce. It provides, uh, enhances industries with knowledge and people, enhancing communities, and of course, underpinning our economy. Australia benefits from everyone having genuine access to a high quality education system. But it also importantly, education is one of, a, of the most powerful tools we have in, for addressing bigotry and inequality. Right now, as we stand at the door of a major policy reform with the Australian Universities Accord, we're in a unique position to have this very conversation. So how do we increase participation in our higher education system and remove the historical underrepresentation of so many groups in Australia? For me personally, as the Vice-Chancellor of CQ University and as the Chair of the Regional Universities Network, I, the rep universities I represent strive every day to increase participation in less represented groups, specifically in, in the regions. But I have to say, uh, it's, it, despite all the achievements, uh, all the inroads we make, it often feels as though where those achievements are done in spite of and not because of our higher education system. If Australia is to achieve its full economic potential, let alone uh, uh, addressing inequality, we can't ignore the need to achieve the same levels of tertiary education participation in underrepresented groups as enjoyed by so many postcodes in the more affluent metropolitan areas. Being from a low SES background, or having no one in your family ever attend university, or identifying as someone living with a disability, or being an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, or living outside major cities, does not make you genetically different, somehow incapable of achieving a tertiary education, or not worthy of one. We need forward-thinking policies that address the costs and the complexity of delivering to underrepresented groups. 
and, and people from disadvantaged backgrounds, or we risk Australia not achieving its full potential. So even with that brief introduction, you can see that there are many facets to this discussion, and I'm delighted that so many people can be here today. And I'm also delighted to have such a, a, an august panelist panel to, to discuss this. Um, you'll see on your screen uh, the panel members, and I'll introduce them all individually just before they give a initial presentation. The initial presentation will only be three or four minutes each. Uh, we'll get through those, and so we'll have plenty of time for discussions. So I invite you all to please send your questions or comments. We can see them on the screen. I'll be able to see them on my phone as well, and we'll get through all of those. We're really keen... At the. Uh, all of the panellists have, have said to me individually, we're really keen to make this a discussion if we possibly can. So I'll start with you, Fiona. Not that you need any introduction, but please indulge me for a moment while I uh, go through a brief bio for you for the benefit of the audience. Fiona Nash has spent several decades living and working in regional Australia. For many years, she was involved in a, in a farming enterprise in central west of New South Wales, which her sons, Will and Henry, are now running. Fiona spent 12 years in the federal parliament as a senator for New South Wales and also held ministerial positions, including rural health and in cabinet, the positions of regional development, regional communications and local government and territories. She also held the position of deputy leader in the, uh, of the Nationals. From 2018 to 2021, Fiona was the strategic advisor of regional engagement and government relations for Charles Sturt University. Fiona was appointed by the Australian government as the regional education commissioner in December 2021, a position she still holds today and as such is well qualified to speak on the equity, on equity more generally, but particularly from a regional perspective. So Fiona, how do we level the playing field to ensure world-class access to world-class universities for the regions of Australia? Nick, thank you very much, and uh, hi to everyone here today. Leveling up, what a great phrase to focus on for this session, particularly for regional, rural and remote people when it comes to education. And I firstly just want to thank and commend Minister Clare for his focus on equity. I have been in the regions for over 30 years, and one thing I know very, very well is that your postcode should not determine what your opportunities are. Because we see such a, such a difference and such a gap between city and country and a whole range of areas for rural and regional and remote people when it comes to education. We know that rural and regional people are less likely to finish secondary school, they're less likely to go on to higher education, they're less likely to accept an offer for a place in higher education, they're less likely to complete tertiary education. And they're half as likely as their city counterparts to have a degree by the time they're 35. So even just those few statistics in that part of education just, I think, really shines a light on the inequity that's there. And there are real barriers that sit there, and many of you in this room know what the barriers are for regional people. It's about distance, it's about relocation, it's about cost of that relocation. I mean, we know for people in rural and regional and remote areas, having to leave home, having no choice but to leave home to attend tertiary education, comes at a cost at around $30,000 a year, and that cost does not sit with city people who can live at home and go on to tertiary education. And that is a really big barrier. And when we look at the most important things around aspiration, access and attainment for rural and regional or remote people for education. There are really significant differences and really significant gaps for those regional people, again, compared to their city counterparts. Aspiration we really need to lift in our regional people. And they can't be what they can't see. When I look at our young people out in regional areas, they simply can't be what they can't see, and we need to improve ways in which we can show them what those opportunities might be. 
And interestingly as well, there's aspiration often that sits with young people in our regional areas, but what they don't have is the self-belief. They don't believe that they can go on to university. They don't believe they could be an accountant or an engineer. And that's again something we have to address. And around access, we simply have to show that there are pathways for regional people and that we remove the barriers to that access for them. And when we come to attainment, they simply need so much support when they're actually living away from home, dealing with social dislocation, dealing with costs of, of living pressures uh, that are really significant, so often in more cases for our regional people. So there's a whole range of things, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. As Nick said, we've only sort of got three, and a, three minutes or so for a bit of an introductory remark, uh, a few introductory remarks. But r I really believe that regional students should have choice, that they should have opportunity and choice to study wherever they want to study. Having said that, though, when we look at regional workforce, we know we absolutely know that if we train those students in the regions, they are far more likely to go on and work in those regions. And we're seeing so many of our tertiary institutions doing great work in training our people to go back into the regions for that workforce because that is such an important part for us to consider at the end of that education journey of where that workforce is needed. And also really importantly, giving those regional students and people opportunity to study what they believe is important for them for their f future and not to be prescriptive. Because it's not just about young students, we've got a whole lot of people who are slightly older in years in regional Australia who might be going back into the workforce or starting to train for the first time and they're just as important. So thank you very much, uh, Nick, for the opportunity <coughs> to be here today. And the last thing I'll leave you with is, is, is my vision. And when I came into the commissioner role, it really crystallised for me something that I've always believed in, and that it's for rural and regional and remote people, regardless of where they live, and regardless of what the barriers are, that they have every educational opportunity they need to reach their full potential. Thanks, Nick. Fantastic. Thanks, Fiona. In fact, I think a round of applause for it. <laughs> for it. T thanks, Fiona, for, for leading the charge on that. Um, uh, I would remind everyone that you can use the, your app to ask questions, and we'll see those questions there, and you can also vote on them so the, the, the top questions will be escalated. Um, uh, so it'd be terrific to make sure that we turn this in, into a discussion, although my experience with even our brief chats um, uh, prior to this session is that we could just talk amongst ourselves. There's so much, there's so much to discuss here. Mm -hmm. Please, I invite you to, to be part of those, those conversations. Can I introduce you all to Anala? Anala Cooper is Director of Marit Barak, the Melbourne Institute of Indigenous Development at the University of Melbourne. She has a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Human, uh, Master of Human Rights Law and is now embarking on her PhD. Inala is a regular contributor on ABC's News Breakfast and The Drum and is a director on the boards of both the Adam Briggs Foundation and the State Library of Victoria. Inala, over to you. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, Nadia Gurjan, everyone. Nayu Nalawal um, Inala, Janu Yaru Buru Rubibi. Um, I'm a Yaru woman. I belong to the Kimberley in Western Australia, um, the land originally known as Rubibi. Um, which is now known as Broom, and I don't come to this seat on my own um, or by myself. I've worked um, in the higher ed sector for about 14 years, and I'm still here. I still love it, and um, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, there are many people who um, continue to support me to be here, including um, my dad, Mick Dodson, who's Emeritus Professor at ANU, um, my uncle, Senator Uncle Pat Dodson, my auntie, um, Auntie Anne Martin, who's here today as well. And um, it's important for me to acknowledge that there are many people within um, the higher ed sector and, and my community who, um, you know, we're not just individual, individual people. We, we come um, as a community. Um, Professor Annie Bronwyn Fredericks, Professor Annie Tracy Bunder, Professor Annie Marcia Langton, Professor Uncle Tom Karma. It feels so good to say Professor in front of all these mm -hmm. amazing people's names. Mm -hmm. um, 
Professor Sean Ewan, I think you're here. Thank you for everything that you've, you continue to teach me. Um, uh, Professor Martin Nakata, uncle, it was just so nice to see you today. Um, and Professor Dr Megan Davis, I mean, what a start to the day. Um, when I did my Masters in Human Rights Law, a lot of people were saying, you know, you've got to do your JD, you've got to practice. You got to... That's not my world, you know, that world that, that, um, that Professor Davis is in and, and other, many other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lawyers, um, I just pay so much respect to them. Um, Arnie, Arnie Pat and, and others who are working on the Statement from the Heart. And I also want to acknowledge people that have gone before me who gave me so much, including um, Professor Uncle Colin Burke, who devoted decades of his life and his career to um, education and to the success of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, it, when I first started in higher ed at Monash, um, I couldn't have got through the way I did without the support of Uncle Colin. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to um, say those names um, this morning because, like I said, I don't come here to, as an individual uh, on my own. Um, I acknowledge my Vice-Chancellor, Professor Duncan Maskell, who works um, really solidly with Ani Marcia and our PVC Indigenous, Professor Barry Judd. Um, so thank you, Duncan, for um, always showing not just your personal but also your professional commitment to our success. Um, sorry, that was a bit of a long intro, but it was important for me to say that, those things. Um, so over the, the last few weeks, I was starting to put notes together um, for today, but inevitably what happens is you arrive and then you see everybody and then there's the morning keynote and then everything sort of changed a bit. <laughs> so I, I do have a few notes, but, um, you know, my first point to go to was the University's Australia Indigenous Strategy, which I was um, really, you know, pleased to co-sign last year when I was in the role of um, president of NATSEHEC, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Higher Education Consortium, which is such a valuable network. Um, mm. That was really my starting point because we had really solid alignment in um, what the priorities are. Um, for access, mm. which is what we're talking about this morning. Um, and then I was started thinking about the barriers, and I think a lot of us know what, what a lot of the barriers are. Um, and then I sort of paused, as I always do, on things around racism and cultural insensitivity or whatever word we want to choose to use, and lack of, of culturally appropriate services mm -hmm. for our students and staff. I think maybe I'll concentrate just on students today, but that's not to say that access um, and retention of, of Indigenous staff isn't important. It is, and it also leads to um, access, retention and success of students. Um, so, you know, and there's values in, in the UA strategy, um, again, which are really strongly aligned with um, the work of Nazi Heck, um, you know, zero tolerance of, of racism and truth telling, which um, mm -hmm. is on all of our radars now, with um, with the statement from the heart, inviting us to engage with the voice, treaties, and truth. Um, and look, one of the other priorities in the strategy is around um, respect for and the embedding of indigenous knowledges in our institutions. Um, that should be fundamental in all of our work. So I invite everyone today to think about um, what racism is. Sometimes when we talk about racism and talk about the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, and I'm sure I'm not the only person who um, sadly continually hears um, stories from students about racism they experience in the classroom and on campus, we have to know what it is to address it. Um, and I suppose just to wrap up um, some, some of those short comments, um, <coughs> access and, um, you know, opening the doors to our universities is not the only thing we need to do to ensure um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students feel they belong on campus mm -hmm. and belong in our university spaces. 
It's the focus on retention and success that's really important. Mm. So whilst setting targets um, is part of our business, please don't just set your targets within the confines mm. of your executive. Um, inviting um, those Indigenous staff on the ground, you know, student success officers and outreach officers that, that are speaking with future students and their families all the time, that's where the expertise is. Um, I'll just leave it there for now. I don't mm. want to keep going on too much. Uh, back to you, Nick. And yeah, I look forward to the discussion Thanks. this morning. Thanks, yeah. Anala. An excellent introduction. Thank you. And everyone, this is Paul Harper. Associate Professor Paul Harper is an ARC Future Fellow at the University of Queensland. He's chaired the Disability Inclusion Group since 2016 and has recently formed a sector-wide disability steering group called Universities Enable. He's also been recently appointed to the university's Accord Ministerial Reference Group, so I'll have plenty to talk to him about that out of session. But for now, let's stick to the topic. Over to you, Paul. Thank you. I'd like to recognise the traditional owners of the land in which we meet. I support the voice. Now, I'm excited to be here today, and I'm excited by the opportunities by our sector in 23. When it comes to disability inclusion, I believe 2023 is the year in which we will see profound improvements in our sector. Universities are the means through which people from economically and socially oppressed groups can achieve prosperity and take up leadership roles in our community. Mm. Universities have definitely had that impact on my life. And changes are afoot now that will make universities even more empowering. One change I want to mention, as Nick did with the, um, men Nick mentioned with Universities Enable, um, it's, well, just in that and other areas, disability used to be approached just as medical, charity, help, Help, the, help those people with disabilities. That, well, we were seen as less. We were not just part of diversity. Disability um, agendas and initiatives were crafted and implemented by persons who did not have a disability. Mm -hmm. This all led to inequalities. The UN Convention of Rights of Persons with, Dis with, with Disabilities has, shift has, has shifted that. It set a new agenda. Disability is now seen as part of human diversity. We talk about equality. We have rights, and those rights are enjoyed equality. Um, now, to realise that, it's, it's a big change. And I think it's really important for all of us to work with people with a disability to try and craft a way that these, this big agenda can be implemented in a workable solution in our sector. And I'm happy if I can help in any way in achieving this. And um, I I'm, was really excited yesterday to hear Minister Clare's strong enthusiasm for diversity, mm -hmm. um, and particularly for um, er, er, like rural and um, lower SES was particular areas. It was a, um, about an hour of a three-hour meeting, and in the other parts of it, it was smattered out throughout. So it's really key to his agenda, and I'm excited to participate in that um, reference group. So back to Nick. Good on you, Paul. Great, Paul. Uh, and the, the final introductory remarks comes from Professor Sarah O'Shea, who is the Higher Education Equity Researcher for the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education at Curtin University. With a 30-year career in the tertiary sector, Sarah is an award-winning educator and researcher in the field of education and so sociology. Her first job in Australia, uh, after leaving Ireland, was working with young people like disengaged from formal schooling a role that told her much about the potential of education. Sarah has held various university leadership roles, most recently as Director, National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education. A personal career highlight, I love this, for, for Sarah, was involvement in the establishment of an alternative high school for disengaged youth on the south coast of New South Wales. The school graduated its first year 12 cohort just last year. Well done, Sarah, over to you. Uh, thank you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land, the Ngunnawal people, and I also would like to say that the keynote this morning has touched me in many ways, mm. and um, 
I see my role in now is to go forth and to make sure other people get the message that our speaker so eloquently delivered this morning. Um, today, uh, Nick's asked us to sort of summarize our key areas uh, for equity, um, and I've been given the whole of the equity sector. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about where I'd like to see the equity sector in 2030. So I've chosen 2030 quite deliberately because um, it's going to be a year where we've actually already got targets to meet. So the National Agreement on Widening the Gap has indicated that by 2030, 70% uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are aged 25 to 34 should have a cert three or higher. Um, and we still have a long way to go to that target. Also in 2030, um, we anticipate a growth in our school leaver cohort. Uh, those born under the Costello baby boom years uh, will be starting to leave school uh, this year. And so by 2030, it's anticipated that school leaver age cohort will have grown by about 20%. Uh, and that has implications for equity, because that means there will be greater competition for places to university. And so we need to be thinking about that. But rather than focus on uh, what we should do leading up to 2030, what I want to focus on is my own three key things that I hope we're not doing. So the first thing I hope we're not doing in 2030 is I hope we're not still referencing the existing six equity groups that we have. Um, so these groups um, were sort of introduced in the 1990s. And for those of us in the room that can remember the 90s, big hair, big shoulder pads, <laughs> it was also uh, the decade where the World Wide Web was introduced. Uh, we were all using floppy disks. So times have really changed since then. Um, and, you know, I look at the existing equity groups as a researcher a little bit like having a Kodak camera in an Instagram world. So it, they're perfectly adequate, but they really do not capture the diversity of our equity student populations. Mm. So that brings me to my next point, which is around that diversity. Um, and so by 2030, I hope we've got a national system of um, measuring and collecting data on our students that actually demonstrates um, that diversity. So approximately 50% of our equity students fall into more than one equity group. Um, recent research from uh, UQ's Institute of Social Science Research has indicated you know, that this is very complex, that when you have a, a young person or a student, an older person, who has more than one disadvantaging factor, that not only impacts um, you know, their uh, educational uh, experience, but it actually impacts it at the different stages of the student life cycle. Um, and, and this is uh, important because you know, if we're, we're going to target supports, we need to really understand who our students are. Um, and while institutions collect that data individually, we need a national framework. So the final point I'm going, I'm going to mention today um, is that in 2030, without giving too much away, I'm going to have a significant birthday, a roundy birthday as we <laughs> call it in my family. Um, and I, I hope that um, a population that I've spent a significant part of my career researching has diminished in number or even disappeared. And what I'm talking about are first in family students. Uh, so first in family students are key. Uh, we have over 50% of our student population nationally are first in their family to go to university. Um, and that varies across institutions. Sometimes it's as high as 70% of the student population. Um, first in family students are often being watched by a lot of people on the sidelines. There's a lot of bystanders. Uh, and I think we need to get this right. And I think we need to really uh, look at that particular cohort carefully. Um, because if we can get it right for first and family students, we actually pave the way for the generations to follow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah.
And so do the questions, and thanks everyone for sending them in, and please keep on sending them in. We'll get through as many as we can. Uh, I'm going to pick one, not necessarily in order, from Catherine, who, and, and because this question, if we could solve this, we, we could all, all pack up and go home and know our job's done. And it's why do you think it, that despite substantial funding, there has been relatively little progress in improving equity access? Um, uh, I, I might ask, Sarah to have first response, but I think we could all respond to this. There is a, a implied assumption there, despite substantial funding, and I wonder whether the funding is part of why we've had little uh, uh, um, substantial improvement. But Sarah, did you want to just touch on it? But I think perhaps it, uh, I bet there's a, the others want to comment as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Sarah. Um, well, I think the key actually is in the question. Um, I think there has been a lot of funding. Um, obviously, there has been a lot of funding. Access. So I think Anala very, um, very uh, succinctly summed it up. We can't focus just on access. So getting students through the door is only the very beginning mm -hmm. of the journey. Um, and I think we need to be very conscious that throughout the educational student life cycle, there are critical stages and there are critical moments um, that students encounter, and they need support, and that support needs to be outreaching. We need to move away from a, um, a, a, an approach of self-advocacy, where students mm. have to mm. advocate for themselves, mm. um, and be more outreaching with uh, support that's targeted, and also is timed to key stages of the critical, mm. of, the, of the life cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like from a rural and regional and remote perspective, um, why haven't we had any change? Because it's hard. It's really hard to make those changes. And when you look at, um, when you look at the, the funding that has been ex expended, it uh, depends what your definition of substantial is, but I think we have to recognise that there is not a never-ending bucket of money sitting under Parliament House that politicians can just reach into. So we do have to be sensible about looking at funding and what's available and what can be done, not saying that where, where we need it, it should absolutely be spent. But I really agree with Sarah around it's not, just, it's not just about access. We should be going right from a regional perspective, right back into regional communities where, where our young regional people are starting, very starting to think very early on about what their opportunities for a pathway might be. We've got to do that a lot better. We've got to do careers advice a lot better. And we've also got careers advice tied up in schools. What about the, the mid-career regional people I was mentioning earlier? They're not at school. They haven't got access to that sort of career advice. I really think we should be looking at um, a, a regional industry linkage into education pathway program where you have a national footprint, you have brokers on the ground, local level, bringing universities, community, local government, students, schools, community groups, all together to look at what the future pathways might be so that those, particularly those young people in those communities can really see what their options are. So I'd really like to see that being considered and also I think some of the reason is, is coming back to this point about it's hard and it's challenging and there's nothing governments can do about tyranny of distance, it's just there. So what I think governments need to think more about is alleviating those barriers. And while there are lots of challenges, there's also solutions out there. We've just got to seize those solutions and put them in place. And I'm really excited that we're going to be able to make more change around these underrepresented groups, represented groups access. Mm -hmm. oh, Paul, please, and, and Anala, I'm, I'm going to work in another question, but sure. still based, based yeah, on the sure. funding. But Paul, you first. Oh, well, just I was thinking, um, one thing we need to recognise is that if you look on stage here, if you add the percentages of all the groups we represent, we are the majority. It's just we're not the majority in all sectors of the society and in all decision making. So if you factored in the majority in all your decisions, then it will be cheaper to be fully inclusive. And look at a building, for example. If you're a vice chancellor, um, how many of your campuses are fully um, disability friendly? You know, it's hard. Have to build, put a lift in is super expensive. To put a ramp in um, can be expensive and not always attractive. But if you had a design, all your systems had inclusion designed into it, it would be cheaper at the long run. And at the end of the day, you wouldn't have to spend as much money on diversity. Mm -hmm. One of the, well done, thanks, Paul. Um, Anala, uh, 
Karen asked, and I'm going to alter her question ever so slightly, but it's about funding, and, and uh, uh, sort of fundamentally, could a different approach to funding universities and students change the outcomes of various groups, but, but, but specifically for First Nations people? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and just tailing off the back of the last question, the right people have to be making the decisions. Mm. Mm. And, um, you know, in, the, in the, the, the ways in which our universities work, um, it's, it's ever so important to ensure that we're at the table, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are at, the, are at the table, but it's often more important that that's a cluster appointment, that not just one person is picked because of their role at the university to be, um, you know, part of a committee. Having more than one voice in the room, I think, is important. And, um, you know, it just comes down to what are we as institutions going to prioritise? Um, and how are we going to prioritise um, whatever the given budget is? Um, so, sorry, Paul, what was the, the, uh, the, uh, the other question? The question yeah, you it, it was specifically, is it, is it about money? Is it more yeah, okay. the, the right funding for students as well as universities? Yeah. So, thinking about the video that we saw this morning before Professor Davis spoke, um, if money was the answer, a lot of... Um, problems or whatever word you want to use, would have been solved by now. Mm. Um, it's not always the money, it's the people and the way in which the people of our universities um, gather and think and strategise and prioritise. So, I mean, I think we would probably all agree, generally, we all, all of our specific areas do need more resourcing. Um, but we have to be smart about it, like Paul says. If, if there was an overlay, a, a fundamental overlay of, um, a, you know, e equity and access on all of our infrastructure and all of our services, it would be cheaper in the long run and um, it would make our, our built environments, our campuses, much more welcoming. Um, and like I said earlier, they, our campuses need to be places where people feel that they belong mm. and that they're not an other. Um, I think the belonging... Um, idea or ideal is um, a better way to think about it rather than, um, what's that word? Inclusion. Mm. Mm. I just hate the word inclusion. Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, we're inclusive. Welcome. You know, the, the Ngunnawal Nambri people are very generous when they, when they welcome us here onto country and, and in many other places. So I think, um, just to go on another little tangent, forget inclusion. Um, and rethink um, how we are improving our services and our systems and processes. Yeah. Um, thanks, Anala. Um, Sarah, I, I'm going to throw the, this question to you, and it's about our engagement with at the secondary school level. Mm -hmm. And it's just to honour the brave person, the very first person to, to ask the question. And it, we've lost it on the screen, but I've still got it here, and it's this. How can the higher education sector better coordinate its support for secondary educators to start the capacity building at high school, uh, particularly for so many communities and families that are less represented? Yeah, it's a really good question. Thanks, Nick. Um, I've just concluded quite a, a large project uh, looking at career development learning for students with disability. And as part of that project, we actually uh, conducted a lot of interviews with um, students and families, stakeholders, um, around you know, how uh, the career development can occur uh, for students with, with disability. And I think it's really key. I think career development and, and career learning is so important. And one of the interesting findings from this research, and I'm thinking, I'm talking specifically about students with disability, is that um, often the careers advisors in schools uh, do, do struggle. You know, they're often um, a teacher as well, and they're not adequately uh, resourced to provide the level of um, support that's needed. And that's a really key area. Um, it's really engaging it within the schools with young people, but doing that uh, through career development um, learners is one way to actually uh, if you like, not uh, raise aspirations because all these students have aspirations, but actually maybe widen their aspirations or scaffold their aspirations, whatever they might be. 
Fantastic. Um, but Paul, uh, next question to you, if I may, uh, because Inala talked about uh, culturally appropriate services, but that extends also to physically appropriate services and access and, you know, digital access and that sort of stuff. And this question um, uh, uh, comes from uh, someone that's kept their name secret, but it's how do we move from supporting individuals to overcome barriers, and I, we're okay with that maybe, or we're starting there, to more structural and strategic work to remove the barriers themselves. Well, <clears throat> I'll know that I have to go to Hamilton, the musical, but I won't break into song. We need to be in the <laughs> room where it happened. We need to be in that room because that's where it's diced up, that's where it's happening. And when you have someone with an expert in that area who has a lived with a disability, an IT expert, you have someone, and they can say, look, that doesn't work, here's, here's the best approach. And like yesterday at the, um, the satellite, we had a digital expert who lives, who lives, with, lived, um, with, with, lives with a disability. We had someone who does design on physical spaces, and we had someone in research, and I do governance. And when you have an expert who can go, hey, look, I've got 50 years or 30 years or 20 years experience doing this, you don't have to pay an external consultant a huge amount, Here, here's the answer. And it can come so naturally, and that's how I think we can really change by instead of thinking of it something expensive, it's something to be, it's cost saving by having someone with the lived experience utilised in your universities. And let's just think, I mean, the report, I'm sure you've all read the report, um, released the discussion paper on the Accord released, it's 9% of students who have a disability. 9% of 1.5 million? Now, I'm a lawyer, so my maths is always bad and we always round up, especially mm -hmm. if we're billing someone. But, <laughs> You know, we're talking, that's 130, like over 130,000, I think. Can you imagine a university campus? I mean, God, we have 50,000. I'm thinking, that's huge. That's like two, uni it's almost three universities. If you go, you know, up to four if you go for small unis. Mm. That's the number of people with disabilities now. And those guys all have expertise. Mm. So tap them, use them. And that also gives them leadership opportunities that they'll thank you for. And it's cheaper, more efficient, and it keeps goals everywhere. So that's what, that'll be my... Answer. Good on you, Paul. Nick, sorry, could I yes, just follow please, up? Because Sarah, um, yes. I know, Paul, you quoted Hamilton, but I'd, I'd quite like to quote you. Um, <laughs> and I think it was in your TEDx talk, you, you mentioned that, you know, anything to do with students with disability, you know, nothing, you know, about us without us, mm -hmm. but you yeah. said, nothing without us unless it's led by us. Yeah. And yes, I think indeed. that's a very powerful statement. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think it cuts across all the equity groups. Mm -hmm. Or, um, Yeah, so I just wanted to say that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, terrific. Uh, Anala, um, can I ask you, because uh, I bet you've been in this situation, and it's a question from Kyle, and it's, it's easy to see access and anti-racism as under the purview of the experts. Mm. Um, what? specific steps do you recommend for senior or mid-level leadership where access is not seen as part of their portfolio, but mm. I think implied of the question is, but they still see it as important. Uh, how would you recommend that they behave? Yeah, if you're in a, a senior or middle management um, role as an, uh, a private citizen outside of your institution, you should still consider racism to be um, an anti-racist um, practice to be important. I think within um, our institutions, um, KPIs um, have a, a language that speak to people. Um, and I think leadership from the top, from our VCs and executives all the way through, um, is really important. If deans have KPIs within schools and faculties um, that they need to achieve, then that can influence an entire um, faculty. Mm. Um, and like I said earlier, understanding what racism is and what it isn't is so important. Um, there's really, really solid work by uh, Professor Peter Anderson at QUT in embedding, um, embedding, you know, online um, workshops or in-person workshops that everyone has to do before they can, uh, you know, proceed in their role. Um, and you know, there's other really great examples about how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and knowledges are prioritised across our country because of our colonial history. Um, Macquarie have just renamed all of their campuses to their original place names, which I think is fantastic, and that was led um, 
by Dr Leanne Holt and others at, at Macquarie. So it goes back to um, what an institution and the leadership of that institution is prepared to set as a priority and how individual people in those roles then can influence down into middle management and across all of our, our faculties and schools and divisions. Um, and finally, just providing space and resources for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, to have our diverse experiences and views expressed in a safe way, in our own way, to influence um, policy and and how you know services are rolled out, how our procedures are run. Yeah. And Al, I'm aware of the time, but but can I ask you a, a question directly from my heart? Uh, we're always worried about attrition, and the the uh, underrepresented groups often form a higher attrition, form a higher attrition stats for universities. Um, and I suspect a lot of it is because. Uh, they're often first in family as well. They often feel as though they're either culturally or physically not, uh, not welcomed by the university. They may feel as though they're a faker. The sorts of things that you are talking about, will that help address that attrition problem? Because I know it's oh, the heart of every... Yeah, absolutely it will. You know, when a student comes to me and says, every time I go to my lecture, um, I feel this way because my lecturer singles me out because I, they know I'm the only Aboriginal person in the room. So when, that's an example of when students, uh, individual students are made to be the expert or, um, or worse, they're singled out um, and receive discriminatory um, comments. So um, yeah, the, the, the student experience is so important and when we talk about students and think about students, we have to remind ourselves that they are individual people who come from families. Um, with a diverse range of, of experiences. And in outreach, we were just talking about, um, you know, preparing young people and, and um, going past year 11 and 12 um, down to younger ages. Um, that's so important as well, so that, um, you know, the right to an education is um, asserted by all equity groups, but by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, in particular, so that when they do arrive at university, they're ready, their previous academic success has been really solid, and I think universities have a stronger role to play in influencing um, primary and secondary schools in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, if I may, because Lara has asked this question, and I think it's because uh, you touched on uh, the appropriateness or the inappropriateness of the different equity groups that we have identified in the past, I think the, the six that you were saying. And Lara asked, how do we better assess and understand prospective students that are not generally thought to be equity and would not uh, present through traditional admission, admission processes? The example she gives is young parents. Mm. Mm. Yeah, look, um, I suppose to answer that question, I, I suggest, um, I'm going a little bit off tangent here, but my daughter recently introduced me to using stopped subtitles when I watch television. So I now watch Vera, Shetland, all with subtitles. And I bring that up only because um, I think we have a lot to learn for universal design for learning. So um, when we design with an equity lens, when we consider everything from an equity perspective, it actually benefits everyone. So rather than having equity as an add-on, as mm. an extra, um, we actually go from an equity perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and then when students have specific additional needs, yeah, we build on at that point. But all students benefit from an equity approach to educating. Mm. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to be wrapping it up pretty soon with final comments from everyone, but, but Fiona, if I may uh, just honour Catherine's question. It was a while back, um, and it's about regional students, uh, and I might add to it if I may. Uh, what do regional universities need to do better to enable students to reach their full potential? And, and can I add on that, because you just touched on that, that difference between making sure individuals have all their choice but the danger of hollowing out the regions mm. if you keep on sending regions to the metropolitan area. Did you want to touch yeah, on that? Absolutely. Um, the first part, I think regional universities are doing a brilliant job in terms of access and support for regional and rural and remote students. And, and actually, it's the regional universities. There was some discussion yesterday at the reference group 
um, around the underrepresented groups, and they are leading the way in the work that's being done with underrepresented groups. So I think, you know, hats off, hats off to them, just terrific. I think the question is more around what needs to be done more broadly to make sure that those regional students get a better experience at regional universities. I don't think it's just regional universities' responsibility to improve those circumstances. So I'd go back to some of the comments I've already said today about removing the barriers and making sure that we've got the support services in there for the universities and how, how do communities support those students uh, and what does government need to do further to make sure that those opportunities are there and that experience for the rural and regional student is lifted. So, sure, regional universities have a responsibility. I think they're doing it really well, but there's a lot of other factors as well that we need to, be, need to consider. And the second part of your question, Nick, this is really important, and it's the balance between rural and regional remote students and choice, and their choice to go to wherever they want to go uh, to, to extend their education, be it university or vet or private providers, to have the choice to do what they want to do. But we need to make sure that we recognise the absolute value that those regional universities are providing, not only to those students, but to those regional communities in which they reside. And it's massively important because what they make in terms of contribution to their local economies, um, their local social fabric, it's, it's absolutely huge. So what we need then, of course, is, um, is regional students and city students coming out to the regions, which we haven't touched on, is probably a conversation for another day, to make sure that those regional universities are sustainable. So it's for me, it's making sure that there's not policies put in place by decision makers that skew the movement of those regional students and where they want to go, that it's a true and genuine decision of choice of where they want to go. Fantastic. Thanks, Fiona. Um, we've promised that this would be future focused and many of the responses uh, from our panellists today have focused on, on where we can improve. So I've asked them all to respond to just one last question, the same question each within a minute, and it's this. What is one... Paul, you're first, okay. by the way. Uh, <laughs> what, <Security>. is one, <laughs> what is one action that you would hope the government undertakes within the next three years to affect real change and genuinely improve tertiary education and accessibility for underrepresented groups, Paul? The government is going to do this. Jason Clare is super serious about diversity. He's gone... He's... If you look at... When you spend any time with Jason, you'll see 1994 speech I've read of his, all about diversity, inclusion, his first speech to Parliament, right on the money. The accord process, it's central. And he's going to get this through Parliament. If you look and through the, through the government, um, Bill Shorten, you look at the NDIA reforms, it's got nothing about us without us. I sent him one of the papers we wrote and had a good conversation around this. It, it's there. Kurt, Kurt Friendly used to be a Paralympian with me. He's chair, guy in a wheelchair. You know, we've got that elbow, elbow our Prime Minister, he's going with the voice, of voice, the voice. It's, they're serious. So this is going to happen, and I'm, I'm really excited by that, and I think you'll have the accord, and under that you'll have diversity strategies for each area and an intersecting also approach. But for us, as a sector, we need to think, we also want to have a voice in that, and I think the best way we can do it is by putting forward a diversity strategies for the sector, by the sector, and then government working with the government. So otherwise, otherwise we run the risk that someone in government will set targets, and some of those targets you've got to see are pretty serious. I mean, NDIA has a target now, sorry, NDIA, 17% people with disabilities, 7% seven, um, 7 in the Australian Public Service. So there's targets, they're, they're hard targets. So I think um, the government's leading the way on this and I think we could do well to um, get a position and move forward with it as well before we're told what to do. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Fiona, one thing. <laughs> Thanks, one thing. Aspiration for access to and attainment in further education for rural and regional and remote people is just so important. Effectively, and, and I think particularly for young people, it's around, do they want to go? Do they want to further their education? Can they further their education? And how well do they go if they get there? So, so for me, the, the one thing that I'd like to see government do over the, over the next three years is have the, the policies, the programs, and the funding in place so that we can remove those barriers for rural and regional and remote people across all of those areas. The things that government do, they can't do everything, but if they can do the things they can to remove those barriers, then that's gonna make a huge difference for rural and regional and remote people. 
Thanks, Fiona. Inala, one thing, one minute. <laughs> the government need to continue to show respect um, and demonstrate to Australians what respect looks like to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and continue to show their open and um, unwavering support of the higher ed sector because in my assessment, the previous government showed complete contempt for our sector. That was a disgrace, I'm just going to say it. Because um, I've got a microphone. <laughs> but <laughs> the, I, I, I really hope and believe that this government will show respect for our sector and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. <clears throat> and they need to do that in a way that the everyday Australian sees it and can model it for themselves. Fantastic. Thanks, Nala. And Sarah, bring it up. I've got the clock in front of me. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go straight to the money. Uh, I'd like to see uh, the work that was started under Bradley, the Bradley Review, completed. I'd like to see the age of independence for youth allowance brought down to 18, because mm -hmm. um, I don't think we can... I don't even know where 22 years came from. What we're, what's happening is that young people can't afford to go to university they're taking gap years so that they can be declared as independent and they don't come back to the sector. Yeah. So it's a very simple measure. It can be staggered over a number of years, but I think it's time to bring that um, eligibility of independence for youth allowance down to 18. Mm, excellent. Terrific. Look, thank you, everyone. We're right out of time. Thanks to the audience for all the questions. Can you please join me in thanking an amazing panel? Nationalisation of higher education through mobility of students has grown considerably over the past few years. They add to the skilled workforce and create meaningful connections. But also, there have been instances of documentary frauds at the time of admission. To eliminate that, a thorough background check is required by the institutions. This is where the need of a trusted credential evaluation partner, CredEvaluate Global, arises, who follows due diligence, ensuring the onboarding of only genuine candidates to top institutions. Specializing in assessing frauds, CredEvaluate Global conducts due diligence using AI-powered software platform, CredEvaluate Assessment Central, to assess the credentials of the applicants. We consistently achieve operational excellence in faster turnaround time with high quality, integrity, ethics and transparency. We endeavour to become the trusted and preferred compliance partner to the global institutions.